Yeah, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Nate Stevens, who's been gracious enough to uh, come out here on a, on a night when, uh, of course, get away from his family and hang out with us for, for an evening. And so uh, Nate is uh, principal brew over at Epic and uh, you know, responsible for a lot of the uh, great loggers. And I think um, if you guys have seen in the San Diego Beer News, they, they just cleaned up on, a, I think, eight or nine uh, awards or something like that. Uh, most amount of awards in, for any brewery in North County. So um, I'm just pleased to have him here. He's going to tell us a little bit about his experience and give us, some, I think, some pointers about uh, uh, engineering some great loggers. Oh, and I forgot to mention, he's an engineer, too. So uh, you know, I think he's going to talk a little bit about that, too. So here, I'll give you the mic. Thank you. All right, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, so everyone here is an engineer. That's kind of the deal. I was, OK. No? <laughs> Quite a few. Cool. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's always fun to come out and, and, and talk to you guys. Um, I just have a, a slideshow that I put together. I've, I've done a little bit of instructing at the uh, UCSD program. And uh, I usually talk about like the transition from uh, I've, I've done talks on like homebrew to pro brewer, uh, uh, just transitioning and stuff like that. And so I have kind of a, a nice little compilation of pictures that kind of walk through maybe uh, it's just over the last 10 years. Um, so this was, I was a civil structural engineer. The company I used to work for, it's called NV5 now. Uh, and they've actually gotten kind of big since I left, which is interesting. But um, the last few projects I was on, there's a... Uh, there was a bridge replacement. You can see the super old bridge. Uh, that's Las Encinas Creek. So that's in Carlsbad, right on the coast there. Um, and then we replaced it with a prefab uh, little arched bridge that they're uh, building right there, putting it in. Uh, and then it's kind of the finished product up there. And then the other last big job I worked on before leaving the industry were these, um, this is the gigantic substation that's out uh, out off the eight uh, for the Sunrise Power Link. And it's like a substation, it's like six football fields in size. And so there's these massive uh, retaining walls that kind of built into the slope. Uh, and that's, that's just one of, the, one of eight that kind of surround the area to make the, uh, the, the whole um, pad. So that's just kind of, uh, I think this was 2011. And uh, it's kind of a blessing now, but I had a horrible manager who I hated. And uh, he kind of, in a way, chased me out of the industry, an industry that I, I liked, but I never, I didn't really want to do it for the rest of my life because um, I enjoyed being an architect, but, I mean, an engineer, but I was annoyed by architects telling me what to do and how I had to get everything done and all that stuff. So uh, something, a hobby that I picked up along the way was home brewing, and I really liked the fact that I could kind of be both, you know, so... I could be the architect and figure out, you know, the raw ingredients and the style and what I wanted to do, and then as the engineer, put it all together and figure out how I was going to get it done. So that was kind of the allure of wanting to switch from engineering and, and take a shot at uh, brewing. So I ended up putting my name in for the uh, UC Davis Master Brewers course. And uh, I think I was like the last person on the wait list accepted in, and it's a, it's a super condensed six-month program, and uh, I have a very loving and understanding wife. <laughs> and so I ended up uh, moving up there for six months, and all my family's from Northern California, so it was actually kind of a fun opportunity uh, to move back to Northern California for a little bit of time and, and, and spend time with them on the weekends. But... Uh, this is just kind of a mosaic of uh, kind of the first part of, of transitioning into engineering. That's a picture of me uh, working in the cellar. Uh, I started out at Ballast Point uh, in early 2012, uh, just on the bottling line, putting bottles of Sculpin into boxes for eight hours a day for $8 an hour. Um, and uh, it was a grind. It was, it, was, it was a tough job to work on. The, the bottling line is like a... 19, or it was at the time, like a 1967 uh, reconstituted like Dr. Pepper filler. And uh, like the E-stop button didn't work on it and it exploding glass and it's just kind of a, 
it was really a, a, a gauntlet, uh, and and, and uh, you, you had to learn fast. You had to work, be able to work with a lot of people around you, a loud environment, and it's, it's it was really one of those things where it kind of shaped me as a brewer. Just they could you could throw whatever you could at me, and and I I feel confident I could get anything done. Like after that point, so. I started at Ballast, uh, like I said, and then about six months in is when the program started. So I ended up talking to them and convinced them to pay for 30% of my tuition, which was kind of nice. Um, the next picture is the stack of books that you get on the first day of the program and immediately panic set in, realizing I knew nothing about brewing, basically. Uh, but things got better. Uh, the, this picture up top over here is a picture from the old brew deck. Uh, from the Scripps Ranch uh, Brewery. You can see the still in the background, and then there's a canning line going, a bottling line going, and that's the old cellar, uh, cellar one. And then moved on to, uh, this is the, uh, the system at Miramar. Uh, it's a 150 barrel system that was originally a polymer system in Germany that uh, Yusuf stored in a warehouse somewhere for like a decade before bringing it back into use. Um, in 2013, I ended up uh, getting tapped to commission and run the Little Italy uh, pilot system for ballast. And this is a, a picture uh, from the brew deck, little cellar, 10 fermenters, three bright tanks, uh, fun little system to work on. Uh, and then as an interesting contrast to where we were as a company at the time is uh, this is the louder ton they were putting into Miramar, which at the time, I'm not sure if it still is, but it's the largest louder ton on this side of the Mississippi in a craft brewery. Basically looks like a spaceship. It's incredible. Um, this one is just a picture of uh, a beer that was called the Landlord, uh, double IPA, which eventually then turned into Manta Ray, uh, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with, but went on to win gold for, w, or, or for double IPA at GABF, which was pretty cool. Um, this is a picture of probably recognize him. Ken from Sierra Nevada came and visited and got to show him around the brewery. That's kind of a, a dream of, of every brewer. Uh, working at Little Italy was like, it was the job that I always told people, it's the job that uh, home brewers always picture brewers having, you know, whereas the reality is most of my coworkers are just sweating on a brew house doing eight turns of sculpting every day, whereas I'm brewing a, a different beer every single time experimenting with raw ingredients and techniques and it was really a cool job that kind of um, really advanced me in my brewing style in a kind of a, a shortened span than I otherwise would because it gave me so different so many different opportunities to just try everything try every ingredient um, different techniques different yeast strains stuff like that so it was, it was a really cool job to have so uh, this is two of the last days there this is my daughter I think my last day in the brewery coloring and then this was kind of a fun picture whereas this is the old Scripps crew when they were shutting Scripps down and moving to Miramar but uh, that's me and that's my uh, partner Clayton and then there's basically a bunch of different now head brewers at different breweries around town up there um, like uh, Ataraxia, PB Ale House, um, East Village Brewing, stuff like that so it was kind of a fun crew to, to kind of grow up with in the brewing industry and then everyone kind of uh, made their way out on their own and, and it, it's kind of cool to just to, to see how everybody's doing. Uh, and then just also it's just kind of a fun thing to see. And this is a uh, this is their old malting facility, the original one. The building's like over 100 years old. It has an all wooden elevator in the building, which was a really interesting fact, I thought. And uh, this is the building where all of the uh, their flakes uh, come from, so the wheat flakes and the rye flakes and the rice and everything. And then this is their Manitowoc facility, which I think they've moved almost their entire operation to. It was an old uh, AB malting facility. If you if you go, it's it's like the center of town on the edge of the lake, and like as you drive towards it, like the main street, like this thing built the town basically. And there's this giant eight-story like AB mural on the front that they left, and it's kind of cool looking. But uh, 
they, I think AB had shut it down sometime in the late 80s, and then they brought it back online in the early 2000s and hired everybody back who worked at the plant 15, 20 years ago. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so if you buy Breeze products, their malt and stuff, most of that's going to come out of that facility now. And then I visited St. Louis and uh, for the National Brewing with Honey Summit a few years back. Uh, basically where they're trying to encourage brewers to use more honey in, in brewing and I used the opportunity to go visit obviously uh, the St. Louis AB plant which you, if you haven't gone I mean it is the evil empire but it is a really impressive thing to go see so this is this is the brew house and it's like I don't know five six stories tall and it's just just floor after floor after floor of louder ton mash ton kettle whirlpool with like these 40 foot chandeliers hanging down the middle, all Victorian and everything. Like it's it's something to see. So if you're ever out in St. Louis, it is it is worth the trip. Uh, and this was kind of cool. This is uh, Euro Beer Star is kind of the big uh, competition in Europe. It's kind of maybe you could say the equivalent of like GABF over here. And uh, the one of the years I went out there for Ballast, we ended up winning. The most awards of any brewery in the world, us, we tied Firestone Walker, which was pretty cool. Uh, so that's me up on the stage there. And then uh, recognize him from the Sam Adams commercials. He's couldn't be nicer. Interesting guy, but he's very much like the commercials. <laughs> uh, and then up in the corner there is the famous war, uh, mural from Wein Stefan, which is about 40 minutes outside of Munich, which if you're ever in Munich, it's worth taking the little day trip out there. That uh, Next to it is the seller restaurant next door and, and fresh Vitus right off the tap, which is one of my favorite beers. And then this is the uh, Augustiner Brewery in uh, Munich Center. Feel free to fire questions at me if anything comes up, by the way. This is casual. And then this is just a quick one just to kind of give you a, a size and scope of, you know, how different uh, pro brewing can be. A, a, you know, across the country, and everybody does things a little bit differently. These are my friends uh, at Spangling in Denver. Uh, it's like the old DMV that they converted into a brewery, and uh, so this is like a uh, this is their mash louder ton, but it's like it's like a dairy vessel, which you'll see in some small breweries like that. So that's that's them vorloffing onto the paddle there to disperse it. The kettle is just literally a kettle that you have to climb a ladder and like it plugs into the wall to turn it on like it is uh it's not the safest thing in the world but uh it's interesting uh yeah <laughs> yeah totally but like i said you can there's there's tons of ways to skin a cat because these guys have won like multiple world beer cup awards gabf awards for some of their Bel belgian salt beers and stuff so it's pretty cool and then you go to the next one which is malt disney world uh, Sierra Nevada, Mills River, which uh, this is my buddy Pete, one of my good friends. He was the assistant brewmaster for Sierra Nevada and ran that facility out there, so I went out and visited him. Um, this is their five vessel, all copper, 20 barrel, fully automated brew house, um, the pilot brew house, which is incredible. Uh, right there, so. Uh, at Sierra Nevada, they use they use whole cone hops basically, and so they have a whole refrigerated room where you like whole cone hops come in these 200 pound barrels, and they have to be like broken apart, and uh, then they sit in these big bins, uh, and instead of like adding pellets or extracts or anything like that, it's these trash cans full of hops that they're they're dumping into the kettles. So if someone comes in and they take these big bales and they break them all apart, and then someone else comes in and weighs them out and then adds them to the brews. Um, Top center is the famous uh, Sierra Nevada hop torpedoes, how they dry hop everything. Uh, that's the packaging hall, which was basically like you could have done surgery off the floor. It was so clean. It was incredible. Uh, that's, uh, this is the, a picture, kind of a panoramic picture of the brew house. It is truly incredible. I don't know if you guys have ever visited Chico, but if you're going to do both, go to Chico first because this place, like this is, Chico is, Ken trying to figure it out as he goes. Mills River is, I have all the money, I'm gonna do it exactly how I want to. Um, and it's incredible. Uh, this is 
uh, pale ale right off the filter. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and then this is Pete and one of his protégés uh, in the cellar of the giant New Belgium brewery that's out um, out that way too. That's like 20 minutes away from Mills River. So that's pretty cool. So a big contrast from uh, the kayak paddle. And this is more kind of uh, my journey uh, from after post Ballast Point. So this is. Uh, them loading the brew house into our original brewery, which was down in North Park, which was a, a, a former strip club for many decades, uh, which is interesting retrofit. Uh, yeah, absolutely, please. Uh, just real quick, I brought some cans of uh, our special lager, which is basically, it's an international style lager, kind of based on a Japanese lager originally, but we kind of tweaked it to where we bumped up the ABV, so it's like 5.8%. And then we use uh, rice instead of just as to dry the beer out. We also use it uh, for flavor and aroma, too. So there's actually like a nice kind of sweet, starchy sushi rice component. And there's a big uh, centennial hop whirlpool addition, which adds like a nice uh, lemony citrus aroma as well. So, And then the other one is our Pilsner, which is kind of based on a German-style Pilsner, but it's it's... I mean, it's not totally authentic. It's kind of the San Diego version of a German style Pilsner where I think I did a third of a pound of dry hop of uh, Mount Hood. Mount Hood is a nice hop that kind of bridges the gap that has a little bit of that German noble earthiness, spiciness with a little bit of the American citrus on it. So it's kind of, it's a nice beer. So hope you enjoy those. Uh, yeah, the top one, they're physically moving the, the brewery or the brew house in, into the brewery. That's a picture from behind the bar where we're building out the tasting room and um, kind of putting up touches on the cellar. Uh, this is, uh, before we had opened, we're just getting our first uh, batch of uh, kegs in and getting them all washed up and ready to go. That's Clayton and I on the brew house in the tight little cellar. Um, this is, in that tiny little room, it's like the whole facility, everything included cold storage, Tasting room, brewery, cellar, everything was like 1,800 square feet. Uh, so cold storage at a premium, obviously. So we had to do off-site cold storage. This is our uh, clunky old van that we originally started out with. And we had to, once we kegged all our beer, we immediately sent it all off-site to a cold storage place out down in National City, which is like these vast mazes of uh, cold storage from like the tuna fleet days. And now they just kind of sit 15% full with a bunch of random stuff that different industries need to keep cold. It's kind of a weird, wacky, wild place to be. Um, then uh, this is just kind of an aside. This is uh, at GABF. That's the original Sierra Nevada brew house, basically, made out of old dairy equipment. Um, a fun, fun fact about me is uh, the very first br professional brew by Ken for Sierra Nevada was on November 15th, 1980. It was the stout that they make today. And the day I was born was November 15th, 1980. So Ken gets a kick out of that story. Um, this is uh, trying to keg out a tank in the cellar. And so we basically had to like build a pyramid of a bunch of empty kegs at the back and then like bring them down, fill them up, and then bring them up a ramp one at a time, put them on a pallet outside, and then load them into a van to get them out to cold storage. So it was basically the most inefficient way you could go about doing our job, which was a nightmare, and I'm glad I never go back there. Uh, this is uh, this was like our first limited like bottle release. It was a double IPA called The Wolf, and we bottled them one at a time because that's the equipment that we had. Uh, this was a, a barrel, aged, just a picture of a barrel aged beer that we did that, that was uh, turned out super good. It was a moment of weakness. Um, and then this is kind of cool. This was, I don't know if any of you guys have been to our Point Loma waterfront beer garden, but this was the week that we signed the lease. Um, I'm at the building across from it, and that's my my wife and daughter there walking. And then, then this is a few years later at Oktoberfest. Kind of nice to see, you know, from dream to reality type of thing. And then this is the this is the last one. This is us moving into our North County facility right down the street. Um, we moved in. 
I think I've been brewing for about two and a half years there now. So in the top is the building under construction, uh, the uh, cellar floor being poured, the bar being built out in front. Uh, this is the, the brew house coming in on, came in on two trucks. Uh, it's a 30 barrel brew house that we bought at bank auction. Um, it's from a little brewery out in South Carolina. I think it was called Full Spectrum, I think. Anyway, it was a tech guy who like, I'm gonna buy a brewery and bought everything new, immediately lost interest, and then uh, sold everything at bank auction. And so that buying that brew house, uh, basically is what allowed us to be able to move into that size facility because we saved like a half a million dollars, basically. Uh, so this is the brew house getting assembled in, in the cellar one there. Um, yeah, everything's kind of pieced together. This is from above down uh, cellar one. Um, this is the, the cold box, basically, with a bunch of kegs stacked up, no longer down in National City. A um, couple of my cellar guys working to fill in and, and cleaning kegs at the same time. My, my son up on the brew house. Uh, and then just cans and, and stacks of best beer, basically. Uh, so anyway, it's funny to, uh, when I'm in the moment, it's always like, ah, oh, why does everything take so long? But then it's like, oh, this happened in the last 10 years. So it's kind of cool. But anyway, uh, that's my slideshow. And then... I guess I was brought here to kind of talk about um, just blogger brewing in general. And uh, I figured this, like I said, this is a casual conversation. So fire questions whenever you have them. I'm just going to kind of do some broad strokes. I don't know if it's going to be anything you haven't uh, heard before. Maybe you'll, you'll catch up early. Um, but basically, uh, it, it's, it's just kind of, you know, the do's and the don'ts of brewing where uh, raw materials, right? So you want to start with the best possible materials, obviously, that you can get your hands on. Um, if you're making like a Pilsner or something, you know, you got to use, I would say, definitely use the opportunity to sample different types of Pilsner malts uh, and kind of even do some uh, hot steeps and uh, see what you like the best because you will, you will find differences, you know. Um, probably really wide differences uh and at the same time you know there's really really good uh european pilsner malts out there but sometimes you have to be careful uh, i mean i would always taste them before buying them to make your beer because they could be sitting in a warehouse or uh sitting in an open bag for months before you got to them like firemen had huge supply chains and uh issues as everyone did but they also had like employee strikes this year too so i actually and i talked to my friend peter like i think there was some batches of malt that kind of got stuck in places in the malt house that they weren't supposed to be there for that long like specifically uh some of their vienna malt that i thought came out this year was uh it was interesting let's just say so the, the lesson there is Always be kind of nibbling and tasting your ingredients, always smelling, always doing rubs, all that stuff. Don't just be like, oh, that's mosaic hops, because that's, it's the name of what it is, but like, you know, what farm, what year, what was the storage conditions, all that stuff. So always be proactive on that front. Um, that's the best advice I can give for you for like raw materials and handling like that. Um, if you're gonna do something that's more like, uh, that's gonna have some specialty malts in it or things like that, like say like a Schwarz beer or something like that. Uh, it's always a great idea to, um, I, well, my personal take is that it's a great idea to kind of layer your flavors and, and, and add complexity through your malt bill, um, especially in a beer that's gonna be like, you know, somewhere between 4.2 and 5%. So uh, that's kind of where you're gonna be able to, to, to build in some of those complexities. So like let's say for a, a Swats Bear Black Lager. Um, one, of, one of the best tricks that doesn't really apply to me anymore because just the, the scale we're at, but like something that's aw uh, an awesome trick to do, any style, honestly, with, with, with dark malts, is to try to hold off on not mashing with them, but then sprinkling them on the top and then sparging through them. 
Um, that'll help reduce any amount of bitterness you're gonna pull from them. I also try to stay away from anything that like started off or has a husk on it too, like just black malts and, and things like that. I, I stay away from for styles like that. Unless, I'm, I mean, stouts are different, but like something that's delicate, like a, a black lager. I really like Greece's Midnight Wheat. I like uh, the Dehusk uh, Carafa Special Malts from Fireman. Um, things like that are, are things that I, 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 I like to use. Um, I also don't use a lot of straight up uh, caramel malts for things, um, but I do actually really like um, in, in, in little handfuls, like the Vireman Cara Munich and uh, the Brees uh, Cara Vienna malts are actually really nice for that kind of thing. And it's kind of a nice in between. Um, any questions so far? It is uh, flaked rice. So uh, normally if you're one of the big boys, uh, you would actually have like a rice cooker dedicated, like a cereal cooker for your corn or your rice or whatever. Um, whereas when you use like flakes, things like that, it's already pre-gelatinized and you can put it right into the brew. Um, I recommend that. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Raw material wise. Pilsner malt. Uh, for most of our beers right now, it's Vireman Pilsner malt. But I do, I am not opposed to like, um, uh, Brees has a nice Pilsner malt. They have a really nice Vienna malt. Um, I like, uh, uh, what's it called? There's, there's a new uh, uh, kind of, Craft malting in the U.S. is getting bigger and bigger. The problem is right now, I mean, I would be going crazy with all these malts if I still had like a, a five barrel pilot brew house or something, but I'm a production brewer now. Everything is in 30 barrel batches minimum. Um, so I don't do a ton of experimenting, which is, you know, sad for the moment, but eventually the plan is to get a new uh, uh, pilot system out there. But like Skagit is a, a new little craft maltster and they have a really nice Pilger malt uh, that I, a friend of mine used recently and I was impressed with. Real light, real clean. Um, but like I said, experiment. Um, sometimes, well, like going back to what I said, it's like, what's what's freshest, you know, uh, out of out of what you have in front of you as an option. Yeah. So it's, I think, um, I usually hot side we generally only do a 60 minute and a whirlpool edition. And the 60 minute is just straight bittering and it's a really, usually a very small edition, proportionally speaking. Um, and I think we, we generally use like German Magnum is a good one. Um, for most of our lagers, we'll kind of go that route. And then most of our uh, poppy beers will usually, we have a nice uh, Oregon grown Chinook that I like to use. So. Uh, on this one, it's uh, actually Chinook for the 60, which is interesting. And then um, it's Tetanang in the Whirlpool to give it kind of that German underlying character. And then the dry hop is Mount Oregon grown Mount Hood, which has kind of that hybrid of a little German, a little American flavor to it. Uh, I really like that beer. Um, hot side. So single step infusion mash, perfectly acceptable um, for almost all the styles that you're gonna do. Uh, if you have the ability to do any sort of de decocting and that's what you're interested in, go wild, it's fun uh, to do stuff like that. Um, if you have the capability to do temperature steps, uh, that's kind of for me, uh, the sweet spot. So most of our lagers are usually two steps. Um, both of these beers basically will start at like uh, 144 degree rest, and then we'll ramp it up and it will get up to about 152, another rest, and then uh, heat it up for mash out, 168 plus. Um, malt from, you know, today it's the best time in the history of human can humankind to be a brewer. The raw ingredients, um, are better than they've ever been. Uh, sanitation knowledge is better than it's ever been, so don't let anybody tell you otherwise about the good old days. Today today are those days. Um, for 
So that, so yeah, I guess, yeah, that helps. That's going to help dry your beer out a little bit for fermentability, basically for us. That's that's what we've found kind of works the best, and that's just through experiment, just straight experimentation, um, and that's for like Pilsner, special lager, things like that. Um, for like Vienna lager or Schwarz beer, we will just do a single step, and it's usually going to be in the four, 147, 148 range. It's kind of a good medium, uh, and it works great. We do. So, yeah, which is awesome. So uh, at North Park, uh, we did not. So everything was basically single step. It was one of those 10-barrel uh, premier stainless combi tanks that you see everywhere in the county. Um, our mash louder ton is uh, it's steam jacketed on the side. So what we do is we'll mash in at whatever our first step's going to be, usually starting at about 3 to 1 water to grist. Um, and then when it's time to step it up, we'll turn the rakes on real slow. Um, we'll turn the steam on and we'll underlet with straight hot lick water that's usually at about 175 to 178 degrees. Um, and then that brings, that'll bring us up to about a five to one water to grist for the second step. And then we go into Vorloff and then into Louder. Uh, it it's pretty quick, so it, it, it's a it's mostly a matter of uh, we can add. I basically get maxed out at about 20 gallons per minute going in, and I'm adding about 200 to 220 gallons. So it takes about 10 minutes. We literally had just signed on with our new distributor, Scout, and that was right when that changeover was happening for the crop year. And so all of a sudden, uh, like basically on a production side. You, you have your, your target starting gravity, and basically you want it to be coming out of the brew house, you want it a little bit higher than that so you can add back just a touch of water and hit your target every single time. So the first couple brews, all of a sudden we were like, instead of being a, a 30 gallon addition, it was like, we're actually under the target. <laughs> I was like, okay, well it's two turns to fill a tank, so then we would make it back up on the second turn, but then downstream, all my projected yields, we're gonna get 45 barrels finished, we're gonna get 52 barrels finished on this. All of a sudden, we're like six kegs short on every tank too. And so that was all, that was very fun to all of a sudden have to redo every recipe and ramp everything back up. So now it's, not only is the malt more expensive and the shipping's more, but you get less bang for your buck. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where we're at. So fingers crossed for a better year next year. And that's globally, every, across the board. You'll find, you'll find some uh, malt batches that I'm sure are fine, but just due to a lot of climate-related is issues and things like that, just the grains, um, you know, a lot of them, it's just not as plump as they normally would be, which was also an interesting thing. <laughs> um, so you also have to adjust your mill gaps too. Every time uh, we we check the mill gaps too. We got burned. We got burned um, one time specifically just because I was like, you should you should always check. Just you should. And we got in a little bit of a like we got all these things get done today. Just go. And we ended up brewing with a different base malt than we normally do. And I have a little tiny sight glass on my mash tun on the side. And I just we had finished mashing in. I looked at it and there's just whole kernels everywhere. And I was like, oh fuck. And so, uh, and that was on a stout. And so basically, that was kind of the worst possible scenario. So your efficiency goes way down. You have all of these specialty malts and roasted malts. And so all of that sugar that you were expecting to create is way less. So now all of a sudden, all of your roasted character is basically double what you were calculating it to be. Because you're going to have a less of a runoff uh, on the back end, right? And so it was... That was an interesting, it was a good learning moment because we got it um, basically salvageable because this was during kind of peak pandemic. So I was able to keep it in the fermenter for like an extra three weeks at like 30 degrees, which if you have that capability will actually take some of that astringency out of a beer because it'll, it'll basically drop out to the bottom. You can keep ejecting it out and it will, and it will basically kind of round its flavor out with maturation. Um, but if I had, if I was on a production schedule, a normal one, that beer would have been down the drain. 
just it is what it is. So lessons learned. Any other questions from the hot side? Uh, always, I always recommend using some sort of world flock and, and yeast nutrient as well. Uh, those are definitely um, key for production brewing, especially if you're going to be repitching your yeast multiple generations, keeping that yeast health up. Um, and then in the transition between hot side to cold side, kind of the, the number one thing I always tell home brewers is um, wort aeration is totally overlooked most of the time. So that's going to be, yes, I, I don't brew, I brew 75 minute boils just because uh, through trial and error and, and how vigorous your boil is. But if you're at like a simmer, 90 minutes, 90 minutes all the way, baby. Um, and if you go any more than that, especially if you're trying to do the light beer, then you're going you're gonna to start developing color as well. So it's kind of that balancing act. It's just what you're comfortable with. Um, good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every time, you we, yeah, you open it. You, you I basically stick a pitcher in there, put it in there, and it's this is this is just this is quick like, this is a uh, battlefield medicine. I'm looking in the pitcher, and it's I want no holes, but I want the husk as intact as possible. That's the sweet spot, basically. So I'm getting to all of the extract, but I'm gonna have a good louder bed with the husks. If you get it too tight, all of a sudden your louders are gonna be a mess, right? Um, so that's just kind of, you have, you have to figure that out on your own too, that's just trial and error. Um, uh, but wort aeration, uh, super important, swirling a carboy, uh, you're never going to get enough oxygen to the yeast, especially for a lager fermentation. So um, I'm not the person to talk to you about super cool homebrew setups. I appreciate them, but that's you're going to find better information online than for me. But what I will say is you oxygenate the fuck out of a lager. It's really hard to over-oxygenate lager yeast. Um, you absolutely can with an ale fermentation. But just all the metabolic processes in a lager fermentation that's properly temperature controlled are happening so much slower that you're never going to get that problem. So basically, like oxygenating pitching yeast on a lager, it, you need to do it at pitching temperature, at fermentation temperature, at cold. You, like I think some of the old articles and books used to say, uh, pitch warm, then chill it. Don't do that because what happens is in that first 24 hours, acetaldehyde gets created, and it's, you're gonna have a really hard time getting it back underneath the sensory threshold. Um, so, like, let's say your target lager fermentation temperature is 50. Oxygenate your wort, pitch your yeast at 50, um, and then a good rule of thumb for uh, same thing with oxygen pitch a ton of yeast. Um, so rule of thumb is at least like twice what you would do for an ale fermentation. I say go three it's, uh, if, you, if you have proper temperature controls. Um, and now, you know, that's also going to be trial and error with, with different lager strains. You're going to have different results. Like some are just won't create any esters or any sulfur. Some will be total sulfur bombs. Some will be right in the middle. Um, some will attenuate really nice and dry. Other times, the other ones are going to be like leave, you know, a pretty strong uh, malt character at the back end. So that's also experimentation. Um, just from a, yeah. No, no, it's all good. Mm hmm. It is. Uh, there, it's, this goes back to many ways to skin a cat. Um, I sat on a lager panel about a month ago for the Brewers Guild, and it was me and Jeff Bagby and Paul Segura and Ryan Brooks from South Norte and uh, Doug Hasker from, 
formerly Gordon Biersch, and everybody did loggers differently on the panel. I mean, obviously lots of similarities, but, but differences too. Um, where I'm the one who's, I'm brewing loggers for production. So I have a schedule. So I have, I'm not cutting corners, never will I cut corners, um, but I have to be efficient. Whereas my man, Jeff Bagby, he's got 13 weeks to get his logger out the door. I don't have that kind of time. I gotta turn that tank over twice, at least in that amount of time. So my fermentation style profile with the yeast that I use is basically, we start at 50, we get about two thirds of the way through fermentation and I let it ramp up to about 60. At 60, um, it's just finishing out primary fermentation. It's kind of like coasting in. And then we leave it there for a couple days and uh, then we do VDK diacetyl uh, sensory tests. Um, that usually takes, it's maybe about on day 10 or 11 is when it, it passes that. Uh, that's also around that time anywhere when it gets to terminal, we're, we're going, it's probably anywhere from six to a nine day to terminal gravity for us. And then in a window, once it gets to terminal within those first three days, we're cropping off yeast for repitch, warm, which is also something that you don't usually hear a lot about, but the yeast health is so much better if you crop off your lager yeast warm than after starting to chill it back down again. Um, so that's that's a trick, um, especially if you're if you're going to be doing multiple loggers. Um, but whatever healthy yeast you can get, pitch it all in the next one. Seriously, take it all. <laughs> sure. Kolsch. <laughs> Kolsch. We do. We, so I have a house lager yeast that I use, but I can't give recommendations, so it's all preference. Like, I don't like, um, do you guys use a lot of like white labs yeast? Um, so like German one for me is, I think it's the Weinstefan and uh, it's, I'm not a sulfur guy. Some people are, sulfur's not for me. Um, so I tend to shy away from it. But if you're making, you wanna make super authentic German style lagers, use that. It's, it's gonna be great. Um, I really like, I can't remember all of their numbers, but there's like the Mexican lager strain is a really nice clean fermenter. And it's also pretty forgiving in that regard. Um, been a while. I think their Bach one too is really nice as well. Um, yeah. They were. They were. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But. Say that again. Copper. Oh, for sulfur. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's why stills are made of copper. It, 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 it absorbs sulfur. So let's say, I, I don't know what your setup is, but this, it absolutely works, is uh, I had a beer that was a sulfur bomb, um, and I needed to fix it. And so you can buy um, copper mesh, and you can stuff it in a process hose, put like a valve on both sides, and run the beer over it and your transfer, sulfur's gone. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does work. So it's not an old wives' tale. It absolutely works. 
Um, the very first uh, batch of spirits ever made at Ballast Point was like a old fermenter they turned into a still, all stainless. And so it's just farty as hell when it was done. And it was like, oh, we need copper in the thing. And so they had to redo it, and then it was fine after that. So yes, copper does work. So, yeah, yeah. Um, it usually gets to terminal gravity somewhere between six and nine days. And then we're cropping yeast within three days after that. Um, and then it stays warm until it passes VDK, which is anywhere between nine and 12-ish days. Um, and then, then after that, we're step chilling it very gradually down. Um, basically, we're doing about five degrees every 24 hours. And then we usually do a stand for 72 hours, somewhere between 45 degrees and 40 degrees. And that's kind of our lagering period there. There's still a little bit of metabolic activity. Um, it's, it's cleaning up all those really green, kind of green beer flavors and aromas. Um, then it's down to 32. We apply head pressure to it, um, stand there for a few days. Uh, clarify it, Biofine Clear, we'll use just a touch, but we, we sheet filter our lagers. Just very coarse, just to get the, the yeast out. Um, it's it, like, I mean, if, if, if you're familiar with sheet filters, whether we're using like, like five to seven microns, which is very coarse, but it gets, it gets the yeast cells out and it gives a nice brightness to it, makes it sparkle. It helps with uh, stability too on the shelf as well. Uh, so, brew day to uh, package, uh, depending on the, my fastest lager is probably about 28 days. If we're doing, um, we have, we do a Zwickle beer sometimes, which is like a really cool dry hop young lager that has yeast entrained in it. I can get that done in like 23 days. Um, and we store those ke kegs upside down. So if there's any settlement of the yeast, turn them over tap them, falls back through, works pretty good. We do about five degrees a day, timeline wise. So if you crash it down, you're gonna shock the yeast. You're gonna shock it out. Um, and also if you add too much head pressure on top too soon, you're gonna also, you're gonna make it go dormant, protect itself, drop out. And any, any lagering effect you're going to get is going to be nil for the most part. You're gonna, it's going to be what it is, basically, at that point. Um, but like I said, like someone like Bagby, he's, got, he's going to chill it slower. He's going to rest it longer. And that's awesome uh, and super cool. But uh, I, my tanks need to turn over. <laughs> With what? I have not, but I was sitting next to the guy who won three World Beer Cup awards a couple weeks ago, all for that. And I was, I was like, I should talk to this guy if I'm ever interested. Um, so some people have figured it out. Um, but yeah, no, we're. I live in the realm. My my brewing style is, I'll take German ingredients on an English style brew, ho brew house and make American craft beer. <laughs> um, yeah, we were already kind of talking about finishing. Um, we'll use, we'll apply head pressure when once it gets under uh, 35 degrees so the beer will start absorbing pressure. Um, but post filter we will touch up with a, a a fine centered stone to hit our carb numbers pretty fast uh, and it works really good. So basically brew house, fermenter, um, filter to bright tank to package. Whereas if we were like an all logger house and we were turning everything over uh, and we had bigger tanks, then you know you see those cool logger tanks in breweries that are like Tylenol sitting on their side. Kind of the main reason for those is it's geometry of the tank. You don't uh, lager yeast can be a little more delicate, so once a tank gets too tall, you're going to create such a, a pressure differential 
that the yeast is going to get strained. And so once, like they'll go into a, a fermenter like that, finish, get close to the end of primary and transfer into those lager yeast for the, the resting, or lager tanks for the resting period, just to keep that pressure off them. No, no. We do, yeah, no. Our loggers, let's see. I will say this, if I, I'll back up a little bit. Um, our target knockout pHs, depending, like on a beer like this, is usually about 5.1 to 5.2. Um, and that seems to make the yeast pretty happy. Oh, great question, great question. Because uh, I'm really good friends with Doug Hasker, and uh, he accused me of brewing with ale water. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, so I brew with Vista City water that's been carbon filtered, and we touch it up depending on the style with uh, Terra Alba or uh, calcium chloride um, for roundness, Terra Alba for like hop sharpness, um, dryness, and uh, and then we'll I'll use food grade lactic acid in the mash to adjust the pH. We usually target about five point three five. Um, calcium sulfate. test like real authentic German beer which is actually pretty easy for you guys because it's you can just you can you can buy whatever water and, and touch it up to exactly how you want it but um, you know they're softening their water they're they're using uh, basically um, di water and 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 building it back up to whatever they want it to be but you know we live in a desert my little hippy dippy instincts I'm from Santa Cruz originally is takes water to make water. Uh, it really does. So uh, I feel like I can brew the types of beers I want to brew with the water that I have. If I, you'd never catch me making a Czech style Pilsner. Couldn't do it with the water that I have. Just couldn't do it. Way too hard. Um, so you kind of have to um, work with what you got, I guess you could say. Like when I was a home brewer back in the day and I lived on a third floor apartment with a tarred flat roof, and it was 110 degrees in the summertime, I brewed saisons. You know, <laughs> that's that's what it was. <laughs> so it's kind of like understanding your place and, and what you have to work with and doing the best you have with it. Any other questions of any general variety? Natural bridge? Yeah, sure. Uh, it means a few different things. Uh, one being uh, if the history of Epic, one of my partners, Stephanie Epic, is the great, great, great granddaughter of Leonard Epic, who emigrated from Bavaria and opened a brewery in Brooklyn in the 1860s. And so uh, we're brewing basically like you have natural bridge being old world to new world, natural bridge, history to the present. And then you have, you know, Brooklyn with an iconic bridge, San Diego with an iconic bridge. And then the one that I don't talk about very much, but I was a bridge engineer. So that's how I kind of sneak that in there too. Yeah, so that it kind of means a few different things. So time and space, geographical, all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't drink as many IPAs as I used to, you could say. I pride myself in being able to, I think we produce across the board stylistically really beers that I'm proud of all the way across. Um, I like that we have a nice range of categorically BJCP two style beers and also beers where we like to take 
pick and choose from a few different styles and kind of come up with something new, like not too far off the beaten path, but like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, make something new. Um, so for me, like when I'm when I'm done and I'm at the tasting room or something, I'm it's usually going to be like a Kolsch or a lager or something like that, something I can have a couple of. I do like IPA still though, and I mean like I love like we have we do a hoppy pills, that's. Uh, it's like a pound per barrel dry hop of mosaic and centennial, and I mean, that that satisfies any itch that needs to be scratched for hops for me. So, did you have a question? Yeah. They can't. Well, to change it, the shock changes. Yeah, but like if you're talking about fermenting under pressure, so absolutely, that is something that people do, and it's a way to get natural carbonation, carbonation in your beer, and some yeast prefer it. It's a way to, like let's say if it's a, a, a sulfur producing yeast, it's, it's a way to stave off some of that sulfur production. Um, I haven't experimented with it too much because what I've found, specifically for my yeast, is uh, if I leave the tank uncapped for a couple extra days, all that sulfur dissipates. Um, whereas if I cap it, keep it in, it seems to be retained. So that's like a throughput thing that I've just figured out over the years, basically. Um, you can create a little bit of that effect though, like if you have a blow off into a bucket by adding more or less water over the end of that blow off, that does create head pressure in the tank and a measurable, and a measurable, amount, a measurable amount of pressure too if you want to mess around with that. You could go online and find a calculator for that pretty easily, I think. All the way back. Then you. Next. I was the best brewer ever. No, it, it, it's most likely because they paid thirty percent of my tuition to go to UC Davis, and and they trusted me. Uh, so basically, I called it Mars. Everyone knows it's there, but who gives a shit? That's if you're in the production facility, right? Oh, hey, look, it's Mars. That's cool. Um, and then they, when they show up, but for me, like, so they needed to be able to just forget about it and not like I couldn't just like not show up for a week. Whereas in production brewing, there's a whole segment of employees that are kind of like that. Um, but you needed someone who could be there and you could count on to come up with a recipe, execute a recipe, show up on time, get everything done. I mean, it's 13 tanks and I ended up getting a second brewer eventually, but for the first year and a half, it was just me brewing four days a week into 13 tanks. Um, so that's probably the main reason would be my guess. Because the people at the time, if I'm thinking about who I would, who I'd have been up against, you know, it's like if I'm on uh, just a very quick aside. Like if you're doing a, a sculpin filter, it took about eight hours, and I would go to work at eight in the morning, and I would leave in the afternoon. And I would hand it off to the night guy, and I'd say we're three hours ahead of schedule. See you in the morning, and I'd come in, and he'd be like, we're four hours behind. And it's like I haven't even been gone that long, and that happened all the time. So that was probably a big part of it too. Just, you know, being reliable is a huge part of professional brewing too. I need to be able to, as my team, so, you know, these last, these last two and a half years, the hardest years of my life, we built a brand new, super expensive brewery, commissioned it, and then the shutdown happened. Um, and so it's basically like working in this giant mausoleum by yourself or with one other guy for years. And uh, it went on and on, and now all of a sudden, you know, since about March, things have picked up again. People are out again. I mean, we have multiple capital projects going on. Like, we just commissioned four new tanks, new canning lines coming next week. Just hired two more guys. And it sounds like a brewery should sound. It should be noisy. There should be people, you know, yelling at each other to, hey, watch out for that, or I need to get this done. And, and it sounds like that again, and it makes you feel good. You know, like, we're kind of back. So it's nice. That was a tangent.
that want to become professional brewers or just as a brewer? It's so cliche, but sanitation is so key. Like I was, I was definitely probably on the lazier side with some of my homebrew stuff, and I'm like, oh, I O is just fine for this kind of stuff. But use use the use the oxidative stuff. You know, use the line cleaners. Um, be like, I was always very good as an engineer measuring my gravities and my pHs and and all that stuff. But uh, sanitation is king. It really is. Um, and then the other thing I said is. Uh, proper wort aeration. That was what I never really dialed in, and I probably should have bought one a little aquarium bubbler thing or whatever you use to, to hit it right, but um, that's what really makes it your your homebrew taste like like a pro brew would. And basically, most of the time, I can taste a homebrew and be like, oh, wort aeration. Most uh, Not all the time, but most of the time, that's usually what it is. Mmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. It, it creates, yeah, yeah. That's And so that's kind of the German ingredients, English brew house, American craft beer thing. Like, I'm, I'm not sitting here in front of you saying we make authentic German-style beers across the board. I, I like to play around a little bit. Like, uh, and, and then it goes the other way, too. Like, our black lager is better than any fucking German black lager you're going to have. And the reason is, is because it's just Pilsner malt and malt coloring for most of those, you know? And, and besides the fact that it comes over on a boat that takes three weeks uh, and you don't know how long it stays in the warehouse, like it's the, the, someone that knows what they're doing in the right hands in, in San Diego or whatever, or wherever you are, uh, you're going to have just as good or better beer experience than any most any time you're going to get something that gets shipped over from Germany. It's just a fact at this day and age. About three days, three, yeah, three, four days. When you're at 32 degrees, yeah, honestly, it's going to be one of those things you're kind of going to just have to be doing sensory on. You'll know, you'll know when it's done because it's going to taste different on day one than it is on day eight. And when you get to that day and you're like, that's what I wanted it to be like. Because it, it's going to keep conditioning, it'll get round, but at a certain point, depending on uh, your cellaring practices, like maybe you accidentally got some oxygen entrained in your work. Well, now it's oxidizing, you know? So it's a give and take. Maybe your fermenter or whatever wasn't absolutely sanitized beforehand. So now it's something else is growing, you know? So it's, it's all give and take. It's, it's where you want it to be. Are you happy with it? All right, let's practice it. No. I mean, what I'm saying is if you're tasting it and you have it held at 40 degrees and you like what it is, like I would say go, you like crash it to 32, give it a few days there too, and then see where you're at and then start tasting it and see if that's enough. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for noticing. Uh, smoked beers are kind of my jam. Uh, I don't like the peaty gasoline fire smoke bombs. I like a little subtlety and nuance. Um, so it's it takes a delicate hand in that regard. Uh, to like the the Vireman Beechwood smoked malt is probably the most available and most widely known. It's kind of has that more of like bacony, hot doggy almost flavor and aroma to it, which is 
It's great in uh, certain percentages, but I've had a ton of success with the Vireman Oaks Milk Wheat Malt. It is way subtler, super mild. Uh, like you you could use 50% of it in your grist and it wouldn't smoke you out of the house, you know? Um, and it's it just such a, it's such a nice little trick in your bag to kind of add depth and character to a beer. Like, uh, I mean, we, we behind, uh, behind closed doors, like the smoke beers, or the series is called One for Us, <laughs> uh, because we're not gonna sell them in production at all. Those are just gonna go through the tasting rooms. Um, so like the smoked Kolsch was just a little bit oak, smoked wheat malt, but then the smoked alt beer had a little bit of beechwood and the oak, just a little bit more punchy. And then our Vienna Lager, which we've actually won a couple of GABF medals with, Procession Beer has like 5% smoked malt in it. And that is just because in a 4.5% beer, it's such a nice little secret weapon to add depth of flavor. Whereas like, if I didn't tell you and, you, like, and you're just drinking, having a beer with friends or whatever, you might not even notice it was there. But like the second I'm like, oh, there's a little bit of smoked malt in there, you'd be like, oh yeah, it's right there. So. If we have them, if we have the beers on, you're gonna have most of the same beers at most, at both places. Yeah, yeah. We have, uh, our, our, our smoked all beer is definitely on right now. And it will be on for at least another month or so. Which smoke is also a preservative in a beer too. So your smoked beers are gonna last longer than your regular beers, shelf life wise. Anything else? So I think that kind of wraps it up for me. Yeah, cool. Yeah, great to have Nate out here. Um, yeah, let's give him another round of applause. That was really, that was great. Yeah.